So what I'm telling you is there's there's been a shift. I mean, I, I've seen bits and pieces of this before, but it's like almost uh, three of every five people I talk to now, they want to get it done immediately. There's urgency. And the urgency is people are wanting money out of their accounts. They don't want money in their bank accounts. Now, yeah. somebody has said to me, well, it could be the $600 thing that the IRS is talking about. I don't, I don't smell it that way. I smell it as people don't want to be in the banking system because they're fearful of losing their capital. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining and welcome back to Wall Street Silver. Joining us today is Bill Holter. He is a precious metals broker and a partner of Jim Sinclair at jsmindset.com. Bill, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, so, Bill, there's an energy crisis in, uh, in Europe, and, and this year the natural gas prices, they've skyrocketed almost 600%. Uh, and basically it's on the fears of the supply for, for the winter going being low. So do you see this spiraling into something bigger? Well, understand where it's it's originated from or came from. Um, you've got these people running around wanting to turn the world into a into a green dream. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about uh, heating and cooling, when you're talking about power needed uh, for industry, green, uh, yeah, it's a nice thought, but it's there's just not enough. And What's happened is, uh, you know, they tried to get away from coal. They're trying to get away from uh, from diesel, from oil, trying to get away from natural gas. And now they're finding out it's not going to work. And just like any supply chain, if you shut it off and turn it on and shut it off and turn it on, which is what ha has happened worldwide with COVID, you know, mm -hmm. just for general products, you're going to break the supply chain. And... Uh, at the same time, they're trying to to, uh, to Europe is trying to push against uh, push against Russia, push against Putin, and that's their some their biggest you know one of their biggest suppliers. So it's it's a it's a huge problem, and it's it didn't have to be. It's it's of their own making. Mm -hmm. Hey, Bill, you know there was just a just recently. Uh, the White House came out with a statement, and I've shared it on the screen here. They're looking for ways to enhance the logistics of moving energy supplies around the nation. And, uh, you know, I, I made a little smart ass comment here uh, with, you know, a pipeline between Canada and the I US would help. <laughs> we could call it <laughs> Keystone or something. Right. I don't know. Kind of doesn't, isn't it kind of, kind of ridiculous for the administration to be? You know, they shut down fracking, they shut down pipeline construction. Uh, they, they've done right. everything they can to limit the supply of fossil fuels, natural gas, uh, production and transport in this country. And now for them to be pretending like, oh yeah, we're working on it. We're looking on ways to help. I mean, come on. It's like, they've already, they've already neutered us, right? I mean. Yeah, it's, it's uh, I guess the best word is it's stupidity. Uh, I wrote years ago that, and this is, I'm going, I'm talking, when I say years ago, I'm talking about 2007, 2008. I wrote that some of the policies that they were putting in place were so stupid that they could not have been an error. They could not have been a mistake. It's mm -hmm. like a plan. And, you know, here we are 15 years later and it's gotten to the point where it's, it's pretty hard to know what's real and what's not real. And it's, it's, you know, they say these things and you bring up, you know, the keys, a pipeline and maybe call it Keystone. Well, there's people out there that, that listen to what's being said and they're fooled. It's like the whole world or especially, you know, here in the United States, People have been so dumbed down. It's just, to me, it's amazing that they can put stuff out like that for public consumption 
with a straight face. It's just, it's to me, it's amazing. It, it, take, it takes a compliant or a, a, a complicit uh, media to pull this off. I mean, absolutely. That, 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 yeah, that they, absolutely. That they won't ask the, the logical questions of, like, why, why isn't some White House reporter standing up and going, hey, are you guys reconsidering the Keystone Pipeline now? You know, you just said you're looking... And, and, and solving the logistics of moving right. energy, or, you know, why, but but no, it's like it's like they don't ask, they don't ask the obvious question, and I don't know, yeah, I know why, but it's well, the media is part of the plan. Yeah, and okay. this could not, all of this could not, none of this could have been pulled off if it was not for a complicit media and complicit social media censoring any type of of uh, dissent descent yeah. of logic, if you will. Uh, Bill, you said in a recent article that the, the financial system is imploding. When will it, when will it will fully go down? Could be days or it could be even months. So what, what signs are you looking at for to fully implode? First off, I look at, at credit. Credit, uh, the credit markets are smarter than the equity markets. The equity markets are like out in la la land, but credit markets see things first. And if you go back to uh, September of 2019, prior to COVID, we had the repo problem where repo rates went from 1% to 10% in one night. And from that point forward, the Fed had to pump $100 billion a night into the most basic of basic credit markets. Now, here we are fast forward uh, almost two years later, or roughly two years later, They've pumped so much money into the system that a few months back, there was a problem where there was, there's not enough collateral, there's too much cash. And mm -hmm. these banks were chasing collateral, they were going to force interest rates negative. So what did the Fed do? The Fed stepped up and they said, okay, we're going to do this re, uh, reverse repo operation. It's now $1.6 trillion and that's going on every single night. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's that's from the credit standpoint. If you look at, uh, I mean, look at the employment numbers, and then put on top of that, you've got these these vaccine mandates all over the place, where they're going to be literally going to be shutting down police departments, hospitals, airlines, you name it. They're they're putting workers and kicking them to the curb. But how do they think their operations are going to continue without these people working? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then let's look at the supply chain. Look at the supply chain of all sorts of things. The, the, the economies, because of COVID, the economy was shut down. Then it was opened up again. Then it was shut down. Then it was opened up again. I mean, look at Australia. They have an entire province or state or whatever they call it, where if you go outside uh, to have a cigarette, they arrest you. You can't leave your house. The, my point being is the supply chain, chains were already uh, razor thin two years ago when everything was humming along, if you will. Mm -hmm. Everything was just in time inventory. Now what they've done is, if you want to think of it as like a, a, a snake that eats and the, the food goes through the snake, it's like feast or famine. So you've got these big chunks going through the snake. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going on with the supply chain. The supply chain is breaking. I mean, just think of of, of uh, the car industry, for example. They have a problem with chips. So what is it? Uh, 30, 40 percent of, of the vehicles that have been produced can't be sold because yeah. they don't run because they don't have chips. My point being, there's there's an attack from all different directions on, if you want to call it, our way of life. Yeah. And I've mentioned this before. The only thing holding the social fabric together is the fact that people are getting their statements each month and their 401k hasn't crashed yet. Yeah. Once once the stock market starts to turn and, and you've already seen some some pretty good hiccups in it. Um, it just looks like it's starting to sputter here. Mm -hmm. Very reminiscent of, if you want to call it 1987, reminiscent of 2007, 2008. Uh, once this thing turns, they're, they're not going to be able to bring it back. They've already pumped too much money into the system. Mm -hmm. So pumping too much money into the system, again, is not going to fix it. 
-hmm. You know, my theory on the, um, and I'll ask you this question, the reverse repos, what you just mentioned, what 1.5, 1.6 trillion each night, yeah. as soon as they raise the debt ceiling and uh, the treasury is probably gonna issue an orgy of new debt and then boom, that all gets drained out of reverse repos into all those new treasury right. bills probably, right? Right, right. They had to do that because there was not enough overnight collateral of high quality that, that banks would accept. In other words, the, the banks are worried about their counterparty risk. They don't want to go to bed tonight and find out tomorrow morning, you know, they took a, a $25 billion loss because the counterparty closed up shop while they were sleeping. Yeah. But, you know, um... and they couldn't, and they, and the reason they, they're doing this is they cannot allow interest rates to go negative. If they allow interest rates to go negative, yeah, you could do it in Europe. You could do it in, in Japan. You could do it in Britain. You can't do it in the United States. Why? Because the dollar is the reserve currency of the world. You yeah. cannot have negative rates on uh, central bank balance sheets. You can't. It, it makes zero sense to have uh, to, to, if you have something to lend and you're required to pay to lend it, what does that mean your asset's worth? That's the question that would be asked and they can't allow that question to be asked. Yeah, understood. Um, you know, what, what you were mentioning with the supply chains, uh, auto, autos, for example, I heard Toyota's cut back production by 40%. Uh, GM and Ford right. have cut back production by one third, um, the energy prices going through the roof, supply chains disruptions all over the place, computer right. chips. It, it, it shocks me that we're not already in a recession. Do you think they're faking the numbers? Are we in a recession right now with negative GDP? Yeah, I, th I absolutely believe we're in a recession. I think inf uh, inflation is definitely higher than what they're reporting. So if you're looking at you know 2%, 3% GDP, but inflation is underreported by two, three, four percent. Well, there is your recession right there. But I mean, it's just common sense. If you look at at the cutback, I mean, the margins are not uh, not huge. When you cut something back 20, 30, 40 percent, you know, now you've got companies not making money. They're actually losing money. Mm -hmm. And from a macro standpoint, what people have forgotten is that the real economy is what actually pays the debt service. And they've mm -hmm. created so much debt where, and of course, interest rates have come down. So the debt service you know, came down as the debt went up or, or the interest rates went down as the debt went up. But the bottom line is if you cut the legs out from under the real economy, there's nothing there that can actually make the debt service payments because the mm -hmm. cash is not flowing. Yeah. You know, um, one of the Fed voting board um, governors, uh, Barkin <coughs> is his name. He came out with an interesting statement the other day. Uh, if it turns out inflation isn't transitory, there's no shame in saying that. And uh, you know, th that's pretty stunning admission, don't you think? That, uh, you know, my, my smart ass comment was, you know, hyperinflation confirmed um, on that one. But Right. What do you what do you think about it? You know, they've they've obviously they're almost embarrassed by having used the word transitory. Okay, so they've caved on the narrative, but here's the real question: If inflation is running, they're saying five point four percent. Yeah, it's it's probably running ten percent, double digits somewhere. Yeah. How much sense does it make for a ten year Treasury bond to be yielding one point five two percent? Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. It's crazy. And that's the problem. So they're caving on the narrative because you can see that the narrative with your own eyes is complete bullshit, but you haven't seen anyone make the leap to saying, okay, inflation's running at, you know, we're, we're telling you it's running at 5.4%, but interest rates are under two and a half percent at 30 years. Who in their right mind is gonna lend money at two and a half percent if they know it's being chewed up at even with the the, the bullshit number of 5.4 percent yeah i mean they're, they're running a negative negative three percent return for 30 years that's pretty much you lost your money yeah yeah I, I, I don't know i don't know how they fix that because you know stop inflation 
You know, the way they did it in 79 was they raised short-term rates above the inflation rate. You know, they had to get it all the way up to right, 20. Right, but they can't do that now. Yeah, they can't do it, yeah. They had that's, to raise it up to 20%. That's not an option now. Yeah, yeah. Back then, the U.S. was not over levered. Back yeah. then, the U.S. was something like 40% debt to GDP. Yeah. They had the ability to raise rates. And uh, as we've seen over the years, they had the ability to uh, to inflate, if you will. The inflation was done by, by levering the system up. The system was not levered in 1980. Yeah. The system is levered like never before anywhere on the planet, ever before. You, they cannot raise rates. Uh, I mean, they could raise rates a quarter of a point, a half a point, and the financial markets will be smoked. Because yeah. remember, all these derivatives that are outstanding rely on an interest rate, an underlying interest rate assumption. Uh -huh. And someone's a counterparty on all those derivatives. So someone someone gets screwed one way or the other. Right. If it, if it goes bad, yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's what they've that's what they've done for all these years now is allowed corporations to say, oh, well, our balance sheet is clean because we have insurance. But the, mm. uh, the problem is you cannot eliminate risk. You can move it around. You can mm -hmm. change whoever the whoever owns the risk by, mm -hmm. by trading the risk, but you can't eliminate the risk. Bill, uh, what, what's your forecast for silver? Do you have any price predictions for 2022? Uh, the only thing I'll tell you is from this point, well, from a, a year ago forward, Mm -hmm. Silver is going to outperform gold for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, I expect the ratio, I, I expect uh, silver to outperform and the ratio to get under 50, uh, probably test that 40 level that we had uh, a while back. And more than likely within the next five years, I think you'll see the, the ratio at least try to get through 30, 30 to one. Nice. So what I'm telling you is silver, I think silver is going to uh, outperform gold a minimum two to one from here. To pick a price on anything, you can't do that. And the reason being, you don't know how badly uh, the dollar is going to deflate. You have no idea. Uh, you know, people ask about, you know, gold forecasts. Well, if the U.S. actually does have 8,300 tons, and I did this math a couple of years ago, so it's much mm -hmm. higher now. But if the U.S. actually does have 8,300 tons versus the amount of debt outstanding at the time, gold would have had to, and this is two or three years ago, gold would have had to be $87,000 an ounce to, yeah. to balance our books. It's now over 100,000. Yeah. So now put a ratio of, put a ratio of 50 to one on 100,000. What do you get? 2000. You get $2,000. To, to pick a number, you really can't do it because you don't know how much gold the U.S. actually has. You don't know how much debt they're going to actually continue to put out. And you mm -hmm. don't know how much money supply. I mean, money supply, uh, what is it, 30, 35% of all dollars outstanding today have been issued in the last year, year and a half. Mm -hmm. So we don't know what the uh, denominator is, and the numerator just keeps blowing up. Yeah. So um, look, I got the line chart up here for silver. Um, and we saw sort of this, this was a sort of the, the, I don't know if I draw lines in the right spots or not, but this is sort of the downtrend that was going within the channel that's been going on for months. And uh, it looks like a breakout. I mean, it's only been two or three days now since we got above the downtrend line. Um, yeah, and you got a little head and shoulders, a reverse head and shoulders. The problem with charts, um, charts used to be wonderful things until they started to be painted. Yeah. And mm. I mean, gold and silver with the COMEX contracts. I mean, what was it? Two weeks ago, we saw $1.6 billion worth of paper silver hit the market in 30 minutes. There is no hoard of $1.6 billion worth of silver anywhere. Yeah. And if there was, nobody would ever sell it in that fashion. So it was done plainly to, to break the price, make the price and paint the chart. So yeah, charts are, you know, they're nice to look at. They're nice to hypothecate about, but they can be painted. And yeah. you saw that a week and a few weeks ago with silver. 
in the last two to three weeks, mm -hmm. um, I've been getting calls from people I don't know. I've been getting calls from existing clients. It seems to me that there is, there's something afoot. People are, are saying, I want to buy gold, silver, whatever. I want to buy it today. I want the wire instructions today. I want the money out of my account today. Mm -hmm. So what I'm telling you is there's, there's been a shift. I mean, I've, I've, seen bits and pieces of this before but it's like almost uh three of every five people i talk to now they want to get it done immediately there's urgency and the urgency is people are wanting money out of their accounts they don't want money in their bank accounts now yeah. somebody has said to me well it could be the 600 dollars thing that the irs is talking about i don't i don't smell it that way i smell it as People don't want to be in the banking system because they're fearful of losing their capital. I think uh, there's just this set general sense of foreboding that something's about to break. Um, I yes. think a, a lot of people are feeling that you can't quite, I can put my finger on it, but I think a lot of other people can't quite, you know, the general population just senses something's wrong, something's not right, and uh, something's about to bust. Something is about to bust. And they just don't know where. Well, and um, all you have to do is wake up in the morning, turn your TV on, or you know, look at the headlines at whatever news service is on your computer. People who can still perform logic are understanding that that in this world, two and two no longer equal four. Mm -hmm. And no matter where you look, that's the case. So I think you have people that can perform logic and still think correctly going, holy shit, I need to duck and cover. Yeah. And that's just my take on it. Yeah. My own personal take on it is I've, you know, I, I, I've been stacking for a while, but I've become a prepper. I mean, I was never a food prepper type of person, but I've now got three months worth of food prepped, you know, stocked and non-perishable foods, you know, put away just because. Right. I, you know, I, I, I see these stories in the United Kingdom with empty shelves from mm. supply chains. I, I sporadically, I'm seeing the same things with some products in my local area. Uh, not everything. There's still plenty of food. It's just not necessarily some of the things you want. And it, you know, something, it just doesn't take that much more with all the trucking issues we're having. You know, they're having problems right. unloading at the ports. They're having tr problems getting enough truck drivers to drive the trucks. Yeah. It's like, if the truck drivers aren't driving, the grocery stores aren't getting restocked. I mean, it's, it's really that freaking simple. Right. <laughs> well, and don't think of it as just food. You need to think of just your everyday, the things you use every day. If you take a medication, um, just anything and everything that, that you use on a daily basis, you know, think about Get an getting idea. an extra one or yeah, get a get a ninety day supply of of any prescription med medication you you're on right now. Uh, you know whatever right. you can convince your doctor to to write a prescription for, get it now. Right. Uh, so you're just not not in that. And I'm position. not sure ninety days will do it. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you do you do what you can. What whatever I, most doctors won't do right. more than ninety do days. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. No. And and you know, not everybody has the funds to do it, but. It, the advice I was given by my my late dad is just do the best you can. That's all you can do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good good words. Thank you very much, Bill. We really, really appreciate your time. Uh, our audience really appreciates you. Uh, let's do it again in two or three months uh, as these as events develop. All right. Take care. Thanks, guys.